will be um, we'll be working together today to to go through all this. But welcome to the biodiversity lesson. It's really really lovely to see you all here today. I'm just checking how many people we have. I think we have roughly over 200 now. Is that? Oh, well over 200. So that's great. It's so so lovely to see you. Um, yeah, Kat will be in the background, but if you have any questions on the chat, please, please let her know. Uh, Jasper, could you just mute your your video just now, please? Is that OK? Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, if my computer decides to explode because it's a Monday morning and it's not working properly, Kat will swiftly take over. But again, if you have any questions, please feel free just to ask in the chat or, or email us. Um, so we both work for Keep Scotland Beautiful and we oversee the Eco Schools Scotland program uh, for, for all of Scotland actually. But it's not just uh, Scottish schools that are joining us today. So welcome to schools from England, uh, Northern Ireland, Wales. It's so, so lovely to, to see you for the first time or maybe this is the second time we've seen you. It's really, really great. Um, and to our partners in in those areas as well. We've got Keep Britain Tidy in England, we've got Keep Wales Tidy in Wales and Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. It's so nice that we can deliver this lesson to over 200 schools across across the whole of those uh, four countries. So it's really, really great. So thank you so much for coming. We really, really appreciate it. Um, remembering again, if you can't see or hear me, try logging in and out again. Try logging out and in again, sorry, and that tends to solve a lot of a lot of the issues. So why are we here? Why are we here today? We're doing a lesson on biodiversity and I am so excited because it's probably one of my favorite topics of all of the Eco Schools program. But why are we doing it now? That's the question. Well, it's because biodiversity in May um, it goes very much hand in hand and you can probably think to yourself, well, why does it go hand in hand, Jamie? Well, I'll tell you why, Jamie. That's because in May, that's when all the birds and all the insects and all the other animals are starting to wake up and they're starting to have babies and get their nests sorted and get ready for the summer and really enjoy it before settling down for the winter. So they've got a lot of work to do. And even just in terms of what's what specific days we have in May. We've just got a list in front of you just to show all the different days devoted to uh, the biodiversity that we have um, on our planet. So it's really impressive and we're really looking forward to delivering this. Speaking about that biodiversity, just a bit of a, a background, OK? Because like I said, biodiversity is one of my favorite, favorite subjects, and I'm hoping it is for you too, which is why you're all here on this early Monday morning. Um, and that's because there's currently around 9 million different species on our planet. That's 9 million different species. So, you know, that's that's a lot of different species, and those are the only ones that we know about. And this is just a very, very small sample on the screen in front of you. So in this tapestry of biodiversity, of all these food chains and food webs, there is such a huge amount of life and they're all so different from each other. But we have to have to remember as well that we are part of that biodiversity. OK, we are just one of those nine million species and one as any other species needs to depend on all of the other 7.9999999 billion species to live. OK, but sometimes we forget that as we're so used to living and surrounded by human made places and stuff. So I'm sure you have all heard of food chains, like I've said. Well, imagine all those chains, all those food webs were joined together to create the biggest food web that you could possibly imagine, filled with nine million different species. Do you think we would be at the very top? Who do you think would be at the very top? It would be us. OK, we would be at the very top always. OK, that means we have a huge, huge responsibility um, to look after everything below us and make sure that we do not impact that massive, massive food web negatively. It's only recently that we're starting to wake up to the responsibility that we have, whether it's with habitats, so where the animals live, whether it's the animals themselves, whether it's the food they eat. We have an impact on all those things. 
So we want to make sure that we protect everything and for that food web to be very balanced and very, very stable. One of some of the problems, however, is that has arisen over the last maybe 100 years. So maybe going back to sort of your grandparents, your great grandparents and things like that. But we have become quite disconnected from that food web. You know, if you look at the places where a lot of us, a lot of the people in the world live today, a lot of them are kind of like concrete jungles. Or even if you live in quite a rural area, it's mostly sort of, you know, farming fields and things like that. So we all firmly believe that if we want to protect our biodiversity and protect our habitats, we have to care about it, but we also have to be involved in it as well. So we have to really love it, care for it and protect it. But we are doing things. There are things that are changing quite a lot, and these are just a few examples on the screen here. There's quite a lot more houses that you're seeing with maybe green roofs and things like that on them, which are so nice to see. The picture on the bottom left, for example, is in Singapore, which is a massive botanical garden in the sort of centre of one of the most populated cities on the planet. On the right, we've got um, blocks of flats in Italy, which, as you can see, they're covered in trees and perfect habitats for so many different kinds of animals. So that's absolutely fantastic to see. But not even just um, going further afield like that. Let's look at what other schools on our doorstep are doing, at least in Scotland, but I'm absolutely sure in Northern Ireland, England and Wales, you'll be doing very, very similar things to what we're doing up here in Scotland. So here are some examples of what schools and nurseries are doing. And it's just so fantastic to see because it really is important. We've got over 200 schools here today and if everybody did something just a little thing it would make a huge difference across the country and that can just be multiplied exponentially when you when you factor that in so it's great to see all these things like bug hotels and uh, bird boxes but even just planting uh, green in green green spaces in concrete areas you know these are habitats and food for animals which weren't there before so it's absolutely fantastic to see so I'm going to stop talking now, or in a couple of minutes anyway, because we have got three fantastic speakers today. But before we go to our first speaker, who I'm so excited to, to see because he's going to take us on a bit of a journey. Um, if you have any questions for us, please send us an email uh, for this. And this will on this address, so ecoschools at keepscotlandbeautiful.org. So we will answer some at the end of the lesson and the rest at our assembly on Friday. And there's a reminder of uh, the quiz as well that we have at the end of this lesson. Um, but yeah, please email everything as well. So keep keep your head screwed on for for the quiz questions. We're not going to tell you to the end, so you need to learn everything you can from the speakers. And we've got a few questions about each speaker and what they're teaching on the quiz. So. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Jasper Hughes, who works for the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, and he's currently at the Highland Wildlife Park. I just want to say a huge thank you to Jasper and our friends from the Royal Logical Zoo Society and Edinburgh Zoo and the Wildlife Highland Wildlife Park for making this happen. So let's go now to the Scottish Highlands. Hopefully you can hear us, Jasper. Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you very much, Jamie. So welcome to the Highland Wildlife Park. Uh, for those of you who don't know about us, I'll tell you a little bit about the park. The park was first set up in 1972 and back then we used to specialise in animals past, present of Scotland. In 1986, we were taken over by RZSS, the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. They own Edinburgh Zoo and the Highland Wildlife Park. So we specialise in animals that are now adapted to cold climate. So we move from a native species to animals that are cold uh, from cold climate. So we have animals like polar bears, arctic foxes, mishmi takin, snow leopards, snow monkeys. So all these variety of different animals. But the animals we're going to be showing you today are a little bit different. In fact, you can't normally get to see these animals. I'm just going to turn my camera around. And we are at the Pine Hoverfly Facility. Now you're probably thinking, what is a Pine Hoverfly? Well, these are some really small, the smallest and most endangered uh, animals that we have here in the park. In fact, they are so endangered, they are critically endangered. So there are very few of them left. So this um, 
building was actually uh, made for, uh, created by the Cairngorm National Park, Forestry and Land in Scotland, Marvellous Entertainment, National Geographic, Nature Scott and the Scottish Government. So we are all working together to make sure that we can look after these critically endangered animals. So what we're going to do, we're going to go inside the breeding facility and we will see what we can find. Uh, like I say, this is where people don't normally go to. So now let's have a look. Oh, Carl, are you in there? Yeah. Oh, where we've got uh, is Carl. Carl, Hello. Carl is actually one of our conservation officers, and he is in charge of the pine hoverfly breeding facility. So now we can have a look in here. So here's Carl. <laughs> there you go, big wave from Carl. So here we have pine hoverflies. Now, what are pine hoverflies? Let's just have a look here at this picture. This is a bit of a close up because they are really quite small. So there is a male pine hoverfly and that is a female pine hoverfly. How do you tell the difference? Well, you're looking at their bums. So on their bum, they actually have three bands for the male and two bands for the, uh, sorry, three bands for the male and two bands for the female. Now, I was in here last week and I was talking to Carly, do you think we're going to get any pine hoverflies for the, the live broadcast? He went, no, no, I don't think so. It's going to be far too early. But he was in the morning meeting this morning and he went, we've got pine hoverflies. So let's have a look in here. So I don't know if you can just about see there is a pine hoverfly on that jar. Now, what is that jar? We've got two jars, in fact. So we've got one with some bird cherry. This is their food. And oh, I can see there is another a bit of food. You can just about make it. It's a uh, cotton wool and it's actually soaked in honey. So these are pollinators. So why are they so endangered? OK, now the reason why they are so endangered is because there is not many woodlands left. They live on the pine trees. Now, there used to be 1.5 million hectares of pine forest covering Scotland. But unfortunately, we are down to about three or four percent. That's all we have left. So we've lost an ecosystem or majority of the ecosystem where these animals used to be found. Now, they used to be found in areas around Scotland, but their population started to drop really, really dramatically when we started losing the forest. They were cut down. Now they're only found in one forest in Scotland. And we are lucky enough for it to be in the Cairngorms National Park. So what we are doing, we are breeding these animals in captivity. So that brings me back to these tubs. So these little tubs that you can see here, this is uh, where they grow. OK, so we can look at the pine hoverfly life cycle. So you can see here, so we've got eggs, then they go into larvae then they go into pupa and then they go into adult and then they go back into eggs and they repeat this whole cycle every year. But what does a larvae look like? So now, like I say, we can't um, pick these animals up and have a look at them, but here you can see a larvae. Now they are, well, some people describe them as rat-tailed maggots. They have that really, really long tail. I'm not going to tell you what that tail is yet because we will be having a poll later and you have to figure out what that tail is used for. And it looks like a maggot with a really long tail. And what they then do, they live like that as, as a pupae, uh, sorry, as a larvae, and then they will go into this pupae stage. So, they form a hard shell around their body and then they change, they metamorphosize, they change and they will turn into a fly. Just like this. OK, so. And this is how they change. And it's really amazing when they go into that pupae, they change their whole body into uh, a completely different looking animal. And it's absolutely amazing. So. The larvae are in these 
tubs and in there there is water and there is sawdust and they actually feed on the bacteria in those tubs and that is it's like a bacterial soup now it doesn't sound really nice to us but for them they absolutely love it and they have um, a moustache where it's, it's bristles I call it a moustache and basically what they do they can use this bristles on or just uh, where their mouth is so that they can filter in this bacteria and then they can eat it so they will then be uh, in the larval form. They will then come out, they will pupate, and then they will turn into the pine hoverflies that we can see here. So we can see, if I just step back, we have lots of different flight cages. So this is where we have lots of different animals, uh, different um, uh, pine hoverflies, and they are put together and hopefully, Carl, have you got all boys and girls? They're all boys and girls. So, and hopefully they will lay eggs. When can we expect them to lay eggs, Carl? One or two days after the, after the jumping. One or two days. Wow, that is super fast. And then they will lay the eggs in the... Into the, into the little sawdust. Into the sawdust. And then the eggs will hatch in about, about four weeks. Four weeks the eggs will hatch. Wow. So the eggs will hatch in four weeks' time. Then they will go into their larvae. And then you have to sort out all the larvae. Is that correct? Oh, I bet that's a lovely job, digging out the larvae. <laughs> so, so this, these are why we have them. Now, this other tub that we've got here, and you can see it's got the bird cherry in. This is actually their food source. So they've got honey if they want extra, but we try and give them a natural diet as best as we can. And they love to, uh, to uh, pollinate and eat the nectar from the um, bird cherry. So absolutely fascinating so we can have a look down here we can see what other animal uh, what other food we've got for them oh we've got some uh dandelions what else have we got carl anything else rowan. rowan so now these are natural pollinators so now pine hoverflies like i say adults haven't been seen in the wild for the best part of 10 years so they are very very rare to see in fact we could just see a pine hoverfly oh they're on the flowers and they are getting some breakfast now when we first started breeding them in captivity we only had 25 animals 25 larvae and they were brought in from sweden or norway was it called oh they were local Oh, these are local guys. Brilliant. Because they do have them in other countries, but we're at the most furthest western of their range, uh, which is why there are so few in this country. So we, we have now bred them from 25 individual larvae and we have bred, correct me if I'm wrong, Carl, was it eight? <laughs> 8,000, wasn't it, last year you bred? That is a lot of work that Carl has been doing to save these really endangered uh, animals. So 8,000 pine hoverflies. Like I say, they're only found in one wood in the Cairngorm National Park. Uh, and what we do, we try and um, release them. Now, Carl was actually releasing them uh, into the wild and you were putting them into stumps as larvae. Yep. And this year, are you going to be releasing adults as well? Yeah, so we've got about 300, so we'll release about 150. Oh, you're going to use 150. Fantastic. Right then. So what we're doing, we are now going to move from here. And then what we will do, I'm going to go to our next animal. But I am going to set you a task. Your task is you should have with you... Um, pen and paper. If you don't have pen and paper, go and get it now, because what I would like you to do is I want you to have your pen and paper, draw a line down the centre, and I want you to write a list of animals that are native, so animals that are found in Britain or Scotland, and I want you to make a list of animals past and present. So what animals would you have seen, say, 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago in Scotland. OK, and what animals do you currently see in Scotland? And is there a difference between the two? So this is your task.
So what we're also going to do, we have a poll going on as well. So a poll will be popping up. Now, if you can't see the poll, don't worry. I'm going to tell you the question now, and that is, what does the pine hoverfly use its tail for? So there should be three, uh, three answers. Is it for um, balance? Is it for breathing? Or is it for... Can you think of another answer, Carl? Pooping. Pooping. There we go. So there's one. And the other one is when did wolves become extinct in Scotland? So was it 1743? Was it 1843 or 1943? There might be some variations between what I'm remembering and what's on the poll, but there we go. You've got the rough idea. OK, now. While you're making your list, while you're looking at the poll, lots of things to do. So you're going to have about 10 minutes to do this. And then I'm going to walk up to the next animal and I will catch you up. And um, one of the other things that you have to do is think about how are pine hoverflies connected to our next animal? And our next animal, I'm going to tell you, are wolves. How are they connected? OK, right then, guys, so I am going to turn off my video. I am going to walk. Say, oh, let's say goodbye to Carl. There we go. There, there's Carl. He's saying goodbye. Fantastic. And what we are going to do, I'm going to turn my video off and sound off. You're going to have 10 minutes to do an activity. I will come back and then we will hopefully see some amazing wolves at the Highland Wildlife Park. See you in 10, guys. Ta Thank you, Jasper. So while we're waiting, folks, I'm just going to repeat those questions again, because like Jasper said, he got kind of uh, mixed up from what he remembered versus what the polls actually were. So if you can't see the polls, please feel free to answer in the chat. So question one, what does the pine hoverfly larvae use its telescopic tail for? Is it sensing predators? Or is it as a temperature gauge, kind of like a thermometer? Or is it as a breathing tube? So have a talk between yourselves. And if you can't see the poll, please feel free to put it in the chat. Question two of what Carl's of what Jasper said is uh, it is believed that the wolf as a species became extinct in Scotland around what year? So was that year 1743? Was it 1854? Or was it 1961? So you've got those two questions to answer. And remember your activity probably now for around five minutes if you haven't started is to get a piece of paper, draw a line right down the middle. OK, just have a portrait style piece of paper right down the middle on one side. Try and think of all the animals that have been in Scotland but are no longer in Scotland for the last, I think, 5,000 years, Jasper said. And then on the other side of the column, write animals that are in the UK or Scotland now. OK, so you can think of a whole load of different kinds of ones. OK. We'll see you in five minutes.
Right then, hope everybody's doing really well. A couple of minutes left to go. So I had a little bit of a panic then. I lost connectivity as I was moving from one enclosure to another. So, but we're all back to normal. So I'll give you two more minutes. I'm just going to turn my camera off and we will carry on again soon. Right then, guys. So, how did you get on with your list? So, what animals did we used to have? Now, let's see if there's anything on the chat. So, ooh. So, now we had two lots of questions. So, oh, so far, the most popular question for hoverfly, pine hoverflies is yes it is a breathing tube so when they're in that um bacterial soup in the in the log or in the pot what they're doing they stick their telescopic tail up and it then what it does it can then allows it to breathe so and it takes in the air so brilliant so now what was the overall question with regards to uh, sorry the answer for when wolves became extinct so we'll let's let's see if we can find a few bits on that let's just have a look oh wolves bears oh fin whale very nice dodo oh they are extinct but dodos have never lived in great britain so now we've got seals brilliant so bears squirrels wolverine link oh fantastic Lots of, I was expecting people to put dinosaurs at one point, but I can see there are no dinosaurs. Good. So dinosaurs were not around 5,000 years ago. So, so hopefully you've got a nice long list of animals that used to be found in Scotland and animals that can still be found in Scotland. So now with this question, I asked uh, this question I asked you was how are wolves and pine hoverflies connected? Can anybody think of why they are connected? So, so I'll pop your answers in the chat and no, nope, no saber tooth tiger, Victoria, I'm afraid. So saber tooth tigers are only found in North America. Wolves eat them? No, wolves don't eat pine hoverflies. Wolves actually are carnivorous and what they do, they feed on bigger animals like deer. Now, what do deer feed on? Ah, deer feed on trees. What job do pine hoverflies do? They're both native. Well done, uh, unknown user. So pine hoverflies will pollinate the trees and the flowers and then the deer or the wild boar will actually eat the vegetation and then the wolves will then eat the deer so this is how they are connected now without uh, pine hoverflies you don't get trees being pollinated if you don't get trees or plants being pollinated then there's no food for the herbivores so the herbivores are the grass eaters, the vegetarians, and then the carnivores, which are the meat eaters, eat the, the herbivores. 
and so therefore it's all connected if you can imagine the ecosystem, the environment as a brick wall, a huge brick wall, and each brick in that wall represents a species. And if you take out a brick, you take out a species, what eventually is going to happen to that wall or that ecosystem? Any ideas what will happen to that wall or that ecosystem if you take out too many bricks or too many animals? What's going to happen? Let's see if anything pops up in the chat. It will collapse, yes, and that is a real problem. Well done, Elizabeth. Crumble, brilliant, yes, it will fall apart. So now I'm just going to turn my camera around. So now at the moment I am in Wolfwood, but we are just looking at these log stumps. Now these log stumps are hoverfly lagoons. These are natural hoverfly lagoons. Now you'll probably notice I missed out the word pine. That's because we don't have any pine hoverflies here, but what we are doing, we are studying the local more common hoverfly because they have the same breeding behavior and reproduction behavior. So we're studying them and then we can apply that to our pine hoverflies. So we're looking after the most endangered animal, but we're learning from a very common animal so that we can look after them in captivity. So we're going to go for a walk now. Like I say we are up at Wolf Wood. So now hopefully the wolves are going to be behaving. They're going to be out and about. Where are they hiding? So we have quite a large enclosure here. It's quite naturalistic. And we have five wolves here in the park oh there they are wow so i'm just going to go to the window and then hopefully we can see them better excellent so there you can see one two three four five there's two at the bottom of the shelter that you can just see now these are like i say are carnivores they like to eat meat so they hunt as a pack so they can hunt anything up to the size of a bison or an elk. You may know elk by a different name. That is moose in North America, but we call them elk in Europe. We've got five wolves here. We've got Jax and his four sons. So now we don't have a female. Unfortunately, Ruby passed away back in 2020, but we're not bringing in a new female because we don't want to breed them anymore. We they we have bred quite a lot of wolves and a lot of the wolves in different zoos are actually related to our boys. So so we're just keeping all five boys here at the moment. So Jax is the one on the right hand side, furthest right, and he has the biggest head so you can spot them here. So now one of the questions was when did wolves become extinct? Well wolves became extinct in Scotland because they had gone extinct in England beforehand but we believe that the last wolf that had become extinct in Scotland was in, drumroll please, 1743. That's when we think the the last wolf actually became extinct and shot. It was actually shot just up the road from us, um, a place called Findhorn. So now at the moment, what are they looking at? Oh, I know what they're looking at. They can actually see, probably smell the keepers as well, because they have their favorite thing, which is meat. So what we do when we feed our wolves, we we don't uh, we, we can't give them live prey. That is illegal. But what we do, we actually put um, uh, carcasses. We have a whole carcass. So we we will gut the the uh, the deer, but we will feed them on the bone, in the skin, on the hoof, because what we want these animals to do is behave as naturally as possible. So let's see what is popping up in the questions. So, oh, the date that they became extinct for Mrs. C is that they became extinct in 1743. So now 
Now, somebody just said, who is the alpha? We don't actually use that term anymore. That term is very much an outdated term with regards to um, animals uh, or, or wolves, because they used to think that the alpha male was in charge by brute force and he was in, he was a powerful, but it's not. Actually, the guy who coined that term has now changed his mind and he's written another paper and he says that they're more like a family. So you've got mum, you've got dad. And mum and dad will have different roles and but they will have overlapping roles as well and it's exactly the same in your family mum and dad are there to help you grow to learn to become a good person and that is exactly what happens here with our wolves so yes dad is still in charge but he is there because he's the dad he's in charge and that's exactly what happens in a human um uh family group as well as a wolf uh, family group now somebody said here would wolves attack people yes they have attacked people so people um how many people do you think of, is a random question for you i wasn't expecting this how many people have been killed by wolves in the last 50 years worldwide is it in their thousands is it in their hundreds or is it in the tens OK, so I'll let you think about that. You can put some answers into the uh, into the chat. So our wolves, like I say, are all um, boys. Um, the cubs are from 2000. Two, two males were born in 2018. Two cubs were born in 2019. Jack's, if I remember right, is about 12 years old. So he's getting quite old for for a wolf. Um, Oh, we got some answers in there. Some people are saying thousands, some people are saying hundreds, some people are saying 500. Mm. Actually, the amount of wolves, uh, amount of people that have been killed worldwide in the last 50 years has actually only been about 15, 16. So very, very few. Wolves will feed on the dead, the dying and the stupid. They will go for the easy option but they are top predators they are not going to go for something which is big and strong uh they are going to go for something which is nice and easy and they will go for elderly they will go for the young or they will go for somebody who is injured but like you say nine times out of ten they don't want to go anywhere near us at all because we're big and scary we cause problems so a lot of the times they do stay away from us so what do we feed them? We feed them horse, we feed them beef, we feed them venison. So um, these, this is the type of diet that we give them. How many wolves are there in Scotland? In the wild, none. There are no wolves in the wild in Scotland at all. They are completely and utterly extinct. But like I say, we have five wolves here. Um, oh, I think there might be another collection with some wolves, but um, we don't have uh, a large amount of captive wolves here in Scotland, but we wolves, um, when we were breeding them, they move around to lots of different zoos. So are there different breeds? Well, there's different subspecies of wolves and wolves can be found as far north as the Arctic and as far south as the Mexican deserts or even the Himalayan mountains. And they are all very well adapted to living in these environments. So they are keystone species. They are very important. So they manage the ecosystem because if you don't have wolves, then the herbivores, the plant eaters, their population is going to increase. There's going to be nothing to regulate them. And therefore, wolves play a very, very important role in making sure that we have balance in our ecosystem. Unfortunately, these animals were taken out of our ecosystem. And therefore, there is there was became an imbalance, and that's uh, also added to the decline of the Scots Caledonian pine forest, because there was lots of extra deer on the land when the wolves weren't able to manage them. So we had to manage them as well. So, oh, what happened to our female wolf? Unfortunately, she had complications, and um, she did pass away. Unfortunately, so. Oh, lots of controversial questions popping up on here. Should we release wolves into the wild? It would be interesting. I'm not going to answer that question. But what I am going to do is if you want to learn more, Google it. 
go onto the web. There are lots of really good websites which are talking about the reintroduction of wolves. Uh, Trees for Life is another good one up in Scotland. Um, and like I say, um, you can find out more about wolves and the advantage and the disadvantage of having wolves back into our ecosystem. Not everybody is happy about having wolves. So do the, uh, what do the wolves do in their den during the day? Do they just rest? Well, what we do, we also do training with our wolves as well. Now, we're not training them to do tricks, but what we're training them is for activity. So we will do um, uh, training for them so that they can run backwards and forwards. Um, they will get feeding every time they go to a station uh, so they can get lots of physical and mental stimulation. And when we feed them, we feed them about... 30 to 40 kilos of meat per week and we feed them twice a week so some days you will see them they'll be very lethargic they'll have the nice big full bellies and then other days when it's like it's going to be a feeding time that they are very active but you can see from our wolves they are very chilled out very relaxed wolves and um there there's no problems at all yeah they do have names uh we've got jacks we've got store we've got ben We've got, oh, the names. I can't remember all the names of all the animals that we have. Um, oh, what else are they called? No, it's gone. So, but yes, they do all have names and the keepers can identify them as well. I look at these and go, yep, they're wolves. I can't identify them myself. The only one I can actually identify is Jax because he is the biggest. But as the boys start to get bigger, it's going to be harder and harder to distinguish between the two. How fast can a wolf run? Very good question. Wolves can run incredibly fast. OK, so um, in fact, if you ever come across a wolf in the wild, keep your distance because wolves can outrun a human. All you have to do is make sure you can outrun the person stood next to you or sat next to you. So, so look around. The people are eyeing each other up at the moment in class thinking, mm, who can I outrun? So uh, what kind of these? These are European grey wolves. So these are the kind of wolves that you would see here in in Europe and they are expanding quite dramatically in some areas of Europe, which is absolutely fantastic. Doctor, that's just about all the time. <laughs> so you want to wrap I, up, please? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, like, it's, fan it's fantastic. I'm getting lots of amazing questions. I know, I so, can watch the wolves all day. They're beautiful. So they're nice and chilled at the moment, which is good. Sometimes they have squabbles, but it's just like any family. Well, I hope you've enjoyed what we've seen today. I hope you've learned a little bit about uh, what we're doing. So, uh, like I say, zoos are very important to ensure that animals will live and survive into the future. So go to a zoo, visit a zoo, make that connection. They are beautiful and amazing animals that we've got in our in our care. And like I say, nobody wants to see them disappear. Nobody wants to see them extinct. Like I say, we are all interconnected, whether it be humans, whether it be wolves, whether it be pine hoverflies, they are all interconnected so that they can make sure that they will live and survive. Now, I'm going to have to say goodbye, guys. So I'm going to put my face back on the picture. I know you'd rather uh, look at the wolves rather than me. But like I say, I'm going to say goodbye and uh, I'll just hand over to Jamie. Are you there, Jamie? Yes, Jasper, thank you so much. I've just been captivated by those those wolves. It was so cool. I wish we could speak to you all morning, but sadly, I think schools have breaks and things. So, but thank you for doing that. We really, really appreciate it. Right. See you later, guys. Ta bye. Bye, Jasper. Thank you to Carl as well. I'm so sorry to have to do that, folks. <laughs> like most of you, I'm sure we could have watched and listened to uh, Jasper all um, all morning, but we're lucky enough, lucky enough to have two more speakers after our break. So before we go on the break, I'm just going to uh, let you let you aware of some things. 
So I was watching the chat the whole time as well with, with one eye on the wolves as well, obviously. But if you have any questions for Jasper, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, Jasper will review them and he will talk about them maybe at the end if there's time, but also on Friday at the assembly. But if not, you can email questions to us, which you can see on the screen now. Um, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, we will return for our next speaker. I'm not going to give it away, but it's going to be just as good and I'm so excited for it as well. Um, so <clears throat> I'm aware that most schools or some schools might not have their breaks right now either. So um, we've got a word search for you, which you are more than welcome to do if you're currently um, not going to be on break yet, but we will resume at 1040. I'll change the word search to uh, an unjumble of words, which is our next game as well, in about ooh, in about 10 minutes. So you get 10 minutes of the word search and 10 minutes of the unscrambling of the words. So thank you so much, folks. I hope you enjoyed Jasper and Carl showing you around the High Highland Wildlife Park. I had a fantastic time and I can't wait for the next two speakers that we've got coming up as well. So we'll see you in about just over 20 minutes. Right. Bye, folks. See you soon the answers to the word search. And I know some people have posted a few things in the chat about the unscrambling of the words, but you can have a look here. And we've got them on the next slide. I see Renton Primary has got some answers as well, which is great. And here are the answers to the scrambled up words. So we've got wildlife, nature, and rewilding. So remember, for I see for some people put um, I think wildering, but rewilding that sort of links back to what Jasper was saying. Remember how we had these huge pine forests um, all over. Scotland, which are now he said there's only 3% left. So that sort of falls in line with that context because rewilding is quite a new word as well. So we're hoping to expand that 3% gradually and get those percentages up over the course of the years and decades to come so that these pine hoverflies um, have still a big enough habitat in order to successfully thrive here. OK, so Moving on, hopefully everybody should be back now. Yeah, I think we're good. I am so excited for our next workshop. Um, it's going to take us to a very different world and way of connecting with nature, the world of senses, words and creativity, and will show us how books, but also our own words can be magnificent allies in our quest for learning, connecting and protecting our wonderful nature. So can I get a big thank you to the amazing Jill Lewis for joining us today and to our friends from the Scottish Book Trust for making this workshop happen. Hopefully I can see Jill just coming on. Hi Jill, I'm going to Hi, hand there. the I'm going to I'm going to hand the reins over to you and good luck and I can't wait to hear what you're going to tell us today. Ah, uh, that's very kind of you. I'm just going to share my content with you. I shall just check that's all working so I can see what we're sharing. Let me just go on to this. Fab on live. And let me just check you can see what I'm sharing. And can you see my screen at the moment? Let me just check. We can see, see it, but I think it just needs to be made bigger. Made bigger, that's all right. Let me just double check with that. I'm just, let me just get there. There, can you see my screen that's now? That's perfect. It's that's fine. And can you see me as well? I'll just check you can see me as well. All good. That's all good. I'll just double check that we can see the next and you can see my next screen. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, all good, Joe. Brilliant. OK, well, that is great. So I can get started. 
Um, and just please let me know if you can't see a screen and I'll go back and, and change it. But I just want to say um, it's absolutely brilliant to be able to join you all for this fantastic biodiversity event. I have loved Jasper's um, event. We've learned so much about how tiny little hoverflies connect to big walls and trees and landscapes and habitats. It's been absolutely brilliant. And in this workshop today, I want to discuss why I think books about wild animals and wild places are so important right now. And I also want to be asking the question about what I consider another type of beast, and that is why are books, I consider books to be fierce and powerful beasts. And in this workshop, I'll also be at the end, I'll be setting you a writing challenge of your own too. But before we do that, I want to ask you, well, we've discussed about all the really amazing animals we have in our environment, but I want to ask you, how does being out in nature make you feel? What does how what does experiencing in the wild make us feel? If we went into a wood on a sunny day with a dappled light coming through, listening to the bird song, how does that make you feel happy or relaxed? Perhaps if you go to a rock pool and you explore all these amazing wonders of what you find in the rock pool, of all the little crustaceans in there, of the sea anemones, and there's that curiosity we see. Or if we walk all the way up to the top of a really big mountain and we get that exhilaration and see all the landscape laid out before us. Or perhaps you feel that cool, relaxed feeling of being just beside a river and the tinkling of the river going by. Being outside is really good for us and it's really good for our physical health and also our mental health as well. And being outside in nature has always been really important for me. Um, so I hope you can see the screen there. This is myself when I was a little child. Um, I grew up in a town, but I was always fascinated by the animals around me. Um, this is me as a baby. You can see I'm stroking a little hedgehog there. I was a sort of child that I would pick up little spider egg cases and earwigs and slugs and snails. And I kept them in little shoe boxes in my doll's house in a garden shed. I was absolutely fascinated by the natural world. But there's another love that I had as a child and I loved writing stories. And I remember I would draw all the little animals that I found. I would write stories about them and I'd draw little storyboards and write cartoons about the animals. But when I was growing up, I wasn't very good at spelling. My handwriting was really messy. I'm left handed, so I always smudged my work. And I remember thinking I wouldn't be very, I wouldn't be allowed to be an author. I thought you had to have really neat handwriting, really good spelling. And of course, that's not true because being an author is about ideas and expressing those, those ideas. But I went on to secondary school, I had big red lines across all of my work and I stopped writing. Very sadly, I stopped writing um, stories and I stopped drawing. But I followed my love of animals and of wildlife and I went on to become a vet. Um, and in the screen now we can see myself with my big dog Murphy. And I loved being a vet because being a vet allowed me to see some really amazing animals and go to some really wild places and also hear stories about people, how they connect to their pets or to their farm animals or to wild animals in, in wild places. So it was a really interesting job. But it was only when I had children of my own that we went back to the library and I fell in love with books again and I saw how much my own children loved reading books and we went on these journeys together through books and I started to write again. I picked up my pencil and pen and I started to write but importantly I wrote as I did as a child. I didn't start with the words, I started with the pictures so I started drawing my characters and places and then I'd find the words and so if you're you might think, well, that sounds a bit like me. I, I can't spell very well or I can't find, I can't express my words on paper. Well, try doing what I do and I start with drawing first and then I find the words come far more easily. 
So you might be thinking today, well, what have books and stories got to do with this workshop on biodiversity? Well, books are vital um, in, in a world of sort of lots of fake news. Non-fiction books give us so much information. They fill up our heads with knowledge. They're absolutely fascinating. And we've got some fantastic non-fiction books out there. But fiction books, stories are also really, really important because they do something else. They do something that's really powerful. When we read a story, the character in the story takes us by the hand and takes us into their world. And we can see what that character can see and we can feel what that character can feel. So if we're with a character who's perhaps caring about whether or not it's a tiger or caring about wolves, we care about those too. And when we care about something, we want to protect it. And that's why stories are really powerful. And it's why I write too, because I want, I care deeply about this incredible planet that we share with so many wonderful creatures. And I want to be part of the change to help protect this. And words are really powerful things. So today, what I want to do is introduce you to three animals um, that are used in three of my books. And we're going to see how change can happen to protect biodiversity in Britain. And we're going to look at three areas. We're going to look at town, we're going to look at the countryside, and we're going to look up on the hills and mountains. And we're going to meet three children who, in, the, in these stories, who help to bring about change. So the first animal we're going to meet, we do find in the countryside, but in this case, we're going to find it in a town. And I wonder if anybody knows what this creature is. We will find this in certain places. Um, it's very it's soft and squishy and slightly damp. It looks a bit like a dragon to me. I wonder how many of you might wonder what this is. It looks a bit like a lizard. Um, it doesn't have any scales, so it's not a lizard. Um, and we find it in ponds and very damp places. Um, it's not a reptile, it's an amphibian. And I wonder how many of you have guessed that it is a newt. It's a great crested newt. Now, these are absolutely beautiful animals. And you can tell each individual apart by the pattern of spots on its belly. So every single animal, every it looks as differently as our faces by looking at the spots on its belly. And these little guys have been around for 40 million years. And you think, they, well, they, if they've been around for 40 million years, why are they so endangered right now? Well, of course, the answer is that they've been losing their hab habitats. Humans have been taking away the ponds and the wetlands and the lakes. And in our towns and cities, we have far fewer ponds and damp areas where these creatures can breed and they can live. And in my story of Willow Wild Thing and the Dragon's Egg, we meet Willow and her brother Freddy. Now Willow and her brother Freddy have just moved into a new house um, where the garden hasn't been looked after for years. All the other gardens in the road are re have really neat and tidy gardens. The lawns are mown down to about half an inch high. All the weeds have been stripped out. But Willow and Freddie's garden is wild and they find a newt. Freddie is really excited because he thinks it's a baby dragon. And when Willow wants to look after this newt, but her dad says, no, we've got to take it back, put it back in the garden because we're going to have to clear this garden. And I'll read from a section where Willow and her brother are trying to persuade their dad not to tidy up the garden. The last owner of the house hadn't done anything with the garden for years and the grass was so long that it came up to Willow's waist. The bushes were overgrown and tangled with brambles and ivy. Nettles grew in thick clumps and bindweed curled around the washing line. Mr Snow, the neighbour, put his head over the fence. Afternoon, he said. Good to see this place having a tidy up at last. Dad grinned. Oh, it's a bit of a jungle. We'll soon tidy it right up. Willow walked on 
and when Mr Snow was out of earshot, she turned to Dad. But I like it wild like this, she said. Can't we keep it like this for me and Freddy? Dad smiled and nodded his head towards Mr Snow. Not everyone likes a jungle. It's a bit of a mess and we need to clear these weeds. Willow sighed. Where did you find your dragon, Freddy? There, said Freddy. He pointed to the ground where Dad had been digging. Willow just stared at some of the empty spaces where the bushes had been pulled up. Freddy's dragon lives beneath them. Oh, I'm sure there are plenty of other places for it to live, said Dad. I think newts like damp places near ponds. Willow looked around. The neighbours' gardens had pat patios and tiny squares of cut grass. Not a flower was out of place and it looked like weeds were forbidden. They didn't have ponds either. But where will it go if we dig up its home, said Willow. It has to have somewhere to live. So Willow and her brother, Freddy, realise that adults have a big problem with tidiness, wanting to keep their gardens neat and tidy. But neat and tidy isn't good for wildlife. Um, what many people call unwanted weeds are actually really important. Dandelions provide so much flowers for pollinators and their seeds are eaten by many birds like goldfinches. Brambles and ivy provide winter food for lots of birds and nettles are a great food plant for lots of caterpillars for some of our native butterflies. So in the story, Willow and her brother make important change because they convince their family that they have to protect the wild and their tiny patch of garden. Now, it's not just in our towns and cities that we've lost um, ponds and lakes. We've lost them all across our countryside as well. And we have a big problem with flooding in many areas um, because we're losing our many of our rivers have become straightened. We're building on floodplains where in the past the, the rivers would overspill onto the land, but we're building on those and we're having lots of problems with flooding. Now there's one animal that can change all this and we're going to go to the countryside for this animal and it's an animal that hasn't been seen in this country for or hadn't been seen in this country for about 500 years but they're being brought in now and I'm going to show you the skull of one of these animals. I hope you can see the skull that I'm holding up. Do let me know if you can't see this skull that I'm holding up and this animal you can see it's quite a big skull it's got quite a flat head and right at the front we can see perhaps the most remarkable thing about the skull is these big orange teeth now these teeth are so sharp that it could bite my finger right off but this animal doesn't bite off people's fingers it doesn't even eat meat this animal is a vegetarian and it uses these teeth to cut down trees. Now, I wonder how many of you have guessed this animal correctly. Well, this animal is a beaver. And beavers are incredible animals. They're being brought back into this country. They are the world's second biggest rodent. And they were killed for their fur and also for an oil that's produced by a gland near their bottom and that oil is called castorium. And castorium was used in, in, as the base in many perfumes. So imagine putting beaver bottom oil on your skin to make you smell beautiful. And it was even used in vanilla ice creams. But beavers are really important because they can change whole landscapes. They're called keystone species. And how they do this, and we can see in the next slide, is they cut down trees. So trees fall across rivers, they create dams and ponds and lakes. And by doing that, they create habitats for lots of other creatures. So by creating these ponds, we have far more insects like hoverflies can live in them. And then you have lots of little bushes which sprout up, which provide cover for lots of different birds. So we get more amphibians, we get lots more invertebrates, we get lots more bird life, we create this whole different landscape and with that comes a very different songscape as well because we hear all these different sounds from all these other animals. 
But they don't just protect other animals' homes, they protect our homes as well because they can reduce the flooding downstream. And in my next story, which is called Song of the River, we meet Carrie and her mum. And Carrie's mum's cafe has been flooded out and Carrie wants to protect their home and their business. But the only way she can protect it is if she can convince the local people to have beavers back up at the nature reserve. But not everyone wants beavers. So Carrie and her friend Alfie have to come up with a way to convince the people to have beavers back. And they do this by reading up about beavers as much as possible. And then they make a poster to show what a landscape could look like with beavers, because to allow people to imagine a different future, then you can get them on your side and you can help create change. So I'm going to read a short section where Carrie and Alfie are making their poster that they want to convince the local people's people to have beavers back. We need to write why beavers went extinct in this country, I say. Beside me, Alfie looks at the screen. It says people hunted them for fur. I read on. It wasn't just for fur. It says they release an oil from their glands near their bottoms that use, that's used to make perfumes. That's gross, said Alfie. You're kidding, right? Nope. The oil is called castorium. It's still put in some perfumes today. It's even used in foods like vanilla ice cream. Ugh, says Alfie. Beaver bum juice. I'm not eating ice cream again. He takes his pencil and draws an arrow to the beaver's bottom. Alfie writes, beaver bum juice used for perfume and ice cream. And I find myself laughing and then suddenly realise I haven't laughed like this for a long time. I take another piece of paper. We need to write how beavers change rivers. Alfie looks at a long article on the computer screen. Can't I draw it? He says, I don't want to write it all out. How do we draw it? Simple, says Alfie. We'll draw two landscapes, one without beavers and another with beavers. Brilliant, I say, and it is a brilliant idea. We have to show what a valley with beavers could look like so we can get people to agree that beavers are a good thing. Mum looks at our drawings. These are really good, she says. It's hard to imagine the beavers could change the landscape so much. Alfie's mum looks closely at them too. Imagine if beavers really could stop the flooding. We've been flooded at the pub several times and it's happening more often now. Jenny says beavers can stop the flooding, I tell her. They've been reintroduced to lots of areas already. Well, let's hope people vote for them here, says mum. Alfie's mum sighs. There are a lot of people who don't want them. But why? I ask. I don't understand. If they can stop the flooding, why wouldn't anyone want them? Well, I guess we're going to find out at the meeting tomorrow night, says Mum. There's a meeting about it at the village hall. I look at the two pictures we've drawn. I know the landscape I want to see. It's the only way we can live here. This is our home now, no matter what I felt before. We need to have beavers here again. And I know we might have to fight for it. So Carrie and Alfie create change by finding about lots of information and then by being able to show people an imagined future, what the future could look like, a better future. And that way they bring about change. Now we've discussed about flooding and flooding is an area in many towns and cities that are below our hills and our mountains. Um, and one of the reasons for this is, and we've and Jasper's discussed this in the previous um, event, is that we don't have many trees and trees hold water onto hillsides. So if we don't have many trees, water rushes down the hillsides very quickly and quickly overcomes our rivers and goes into the towns and villages. And we haven't had trees for hundreds of years, thousands of years, because they were cut down for firewood, for building and cleared for grazing. So that's why we have so few trees and as we learned before we've only got three percent of for Caledonian pine forest in Scotland and because we haven't seen trees for so many generations we think that this is normal we think of it as natural and almost beautiful um, but it isn't and this is a typical hillside or mountainside in, in Scotland and in northern England where we see it covered by lots and lots of 
purple heather. Um, now, this heather isn't natural. It's actually managed to look like this and it's managed by burning. So in the next view, we see these heather hillsides are burnt. Now, they're burnt for 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 a certain reason and burning stops trees and shrubs growing up and the heather is burnt because new heather shoots grow so by burning the heather we get a fresh regrowth of heather to cover the hillsides and heather and heather is grown for one reason because it's a great food plant for the red grouse and this is a wild bird but land rich landowners want many rich landowners who want this bird, red grouse, wants to invite many people to pay lots of money to come and shoot the red grouse. So when we see heather hillsides like this, they're heather hillsides pr to produce lots of red grouse so that people can come and shoot the red grouse. But actually a heather hillside like this is very low in biodiversity. We have lots of heather, we have lots of red grouse, but we have very few other species, a few other ground nesting birds, um, but not much else. We, we've lost the pine hoverflies that we we're hearing about before. We've lost the trees, we've lost the wolves, and we've got these heather hillsides. And any animals that want to also come and hunt these red grouse are killed because if, if they kill the red grouse, then the landowners can't get the money for shooting the red grouse. So foxes are allowed to be killed. Crows are allowed to be killed, but there are some very rare animals that are also illegally killed um, to protect the grouse numbers. And I'm going to show you the next animal we're going to look at is one of these animals which is on the brink in this country because of illegal persecution by this driven grouse shooting, the hunting industry. And this animal is absolutely stunning. I wonder if any of you know what this bird is. It's, you can tell it's a bird of prey. It's got the very hook beak, got the talons, it's holding a rabbit in its claws and it's a lovely brown golden colour. It's a golden eagle and they are absolutely beautiful. And I wonder if any of you know how wide their wingspan is. Well, their wingspan is about seven foot wide. And just to try and imagine that, I want you to, if you can, spread your arms out wide and from one of your fingertips, and if you touch your fingertips to the next person next to you, probably from your fingertips to the furthest fingertips of your friend is how wide a golden eagle, golden eagle's wingspan is. And many people, they, you get golden eagles throughout the world and many people have revered these as messengers of the gods, but very sadly, in this country, they've been killed by people who want to protect the red grouse. And in our next book, Eagle Warrior, we meet Bobby and her granny. Now, Bobby lives on a farm and she loves the animals on her, all the wild animals on her farm. But Bobby's granny's dog, Haggis, has been killed because it's eaten poison that was put out for an eagle and a poison so harmful it could have harmed Bobby as well if she'd come into contact with it. And I'm going to read from the section where Bobby, where Granny meets the gamekeeper who's put poison out that's killed a dog and they know he's the one who's put the poison out for the eagles as well. Angus ignored Granny and walked over to his quad bike. Granny followed Angus the gamekeeper my dog was poisoned yesterday. I've got a funny feeling you might know something about it. Not me, said Angus. He sneered. But it's no bad thing that dog's gone. He was an ugly old mutt. Bobby found him, said Granny, her voice getting louder. Poison like that could have killed her too. How do you feel about the death of a child? Angus looked quickly back at Bobby and started up the engine. Move out of my way. You've got no proof. Granny hadn't finished. If I find any more dead rabbits that have been put out as poison bait, I'm calling the police. That wouldn't be a good idea, said Angus, revving the engine. You wouldn't want to make an enemy of the rich duke. Granny put her hands on her hips. You don't scare me. It's time you lot stop killing eagles. You should go to prison for what you've done. Angus drove the quad bike forward so that it almost touched Granny. 
You don't scare me either, he said. No one has ever been arrested for killing an eagle. There's nothing you can do. You're right, spat Granny. People like you and the rich Duke get away with it all the time. And that's the biggest crime of all. So Granny, so Bobby and her granny have to stand up to the rich landowner and to the gamekeeper and the people in power to have their voices heard. And that's how Bobby brings about change. But Bobby also realises that the area, the grouse moors around the farm where she lives need change too. And the really good news is change is happening in many places in Scotland where the wild is being allowed to come back. Um, and this is called rewilding. Um, and in this photograph here, we can see that we've got trees coming back to these river valleys. And with those, we've got have more habitats for other animals. So if we could bring back this Caledonian pine forest, we'd have more of the hoverflies. And then if we dared to allow the wolf to come back, we would help to bring back these fully functioning ecosystems and it would be good for the planet as well. Now it's sadly it's not just Scotland where eagles have been have been killed. Just recently in the south of England in Dorset, um, two white-tailed eagles, white-tailed eagles or sometimes called sea eagles, are even bigger than golden eagles. They've got an eight-foot wingspan. They're sometimes called a barn door, flying barn door because they look like a barn door flying in the sky. But unbelievably, just recently, a member of parliament, an MP in Dorset, has said that he doesn't want eagles in Dorset. And I think that level of intolerance and ignorance of wildlife by people in power has to be called out and has to be challenged because our planet is so beautiful and under threat and we need to protect it. And I think this goes on to feeling that we feel very helpless sometimes, but we're not helpless about protecting the planet because like the children in the stories that we've heard, we can make change happen and we can do this different ways. So in our first story in Song of the River, we can make change happening by gaining lots of awareness and showing other people um, a future of what how what our future could look like and in Carrie with in Song of the River Carrie and Alfie are able to do that to make change happen in their own village. Another way that we can make change happen is we can take direct action we can change something in our own environment and um, we can bring back and it with in Willow with Willow and her brother Freddie they allow their garden to be wild they allow the um, a pond to bring lots of wildlife. And what I've loved hearing is that many of you, many of your schools uh, and at schools in your homes, you've been doing exactly that. You've been bringing the wild back into your schools and caring for nature. And that's such a powerful thing to be able to do. And we can speak truth to power like Bobby has in Eagle Warrior. And especially there are many places um, we know that our many of our rivers are polluted so we need to challenge the big water companies to clean up our rivers we need to challenge our local councils and our governments to really make our homes and around us a better place for wildlife and another way we can make change happen is we can change hearts and minds and that's why words are such powerful things because what we say what we write can change other people's views. And because words are so powerful, I want to set a, you a writing challenge right now. And this is my writing challenge to you, because when we write about an animal, we need to understand that animal. We need to know what it feels like, what it senses about the world to be able to really empathise with that animal and the problems that it might face. And so when we're thinking about that, we need to think about what sense it has, what, what does it hear, what does it smell, what does it see, what does it feel. So in this challenge, and you can, I want you to think of an animal, any wild animal, and it might help if you want to draw your animal in, in the box that, that will be given to you and your teachers will be able to download this um, into your schools. And then I want you to write a couple of descriptive sentences about perhaps what your animal can see, perhaps something it might see close to it, or far away, it might have really good vision. 
then what does your animal hear? Think about all those sounds. Again, the sounds which might be important to it, the sounds that it might be listening out for, whether or not it's a predator or um, another of its species. What does your animal taste? What does it eat? And what does your animal smell around it? And what does it feel? How does it perceive the world? Perhaps it's got pads on its paws. Perhaps it feels the wind through its feathers. Think about how your animal would sense that world around it. And so I'm going to give, I'm going to start off. I'll give you an example of um, one riddle that I wrote, and you've got to guess what animal I am. So I see the shimmering ice and distant snow clouds. I hear the breath of a seal as it surfaces for air. I taste warm seal blood and salt water. I smell the white fox that tiptoes behind me trying to steal my dinner. I feel the ocean through my fur as I dive through shafts of streaming sunlight. What am I? I wonder how many people can guess what I am. Am I, uh, perhaps I'm a se another seal, a leopard seal? Perhaps I'm, am I a penguin? I live in the ice. Perhaps I'm, do you think I'm an orca, a killer whale? But killer whales don't have fur. So I'm a polar bear. So how many of you have got polar bear? And so what we'd love you to do is to write your own writing challenge, your own riddle challenge and test it out on your with your friends. And we'll be asking you to send your riddle challenges to us, um, to the Scottish Book Trust and to me. And we're going to be choosing some prize winners of some books to have read your write animal riddle challenges to guess what animal you are. So I want to come back to that question that I first asked, asked right at the very beginning. Why are animal, why are books fierce and dangerous beasts? So why are books, why do I consider books to be fierce and dangerous beasts? Well, for me, they are because words are powerful things. Books can change hearts and minds. And if we can change hearts and minds, then we can change the world. So get writing and get changing the world. So thank you from me. And I'm really looking forward to just having a look at some of the questions um, that have been coming in, whether or not about animals, wild places. Um, and I look forward to seeing those too. Thank you so much, Jill. That was so inspirational and speaking, I think, on behalf of everyone around the country. Um, that was just fantastic. I was wondering just before you go, could you show, could you hold up the, the beaver skull again? Because there was a few schools who weren't able to see it. If you just hold it up close to your head. Um, yeah, I've also, so I'm going to show you two skulls as well, actually. Okay. So we've got the beaver skull here, which so you can see it's these huge orange teeth at the front, which just so strong and they these can cut down trees. Um, and actually, if you did put your finger there, your finger would be gone in an instant. Um, so that's that's the beaver skull. Um, incredible things. And that's you can see the chewing teeth at the back where they'll grind up vegetation. Um, people used to, people actually the Narnia books, um, the Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, the beavers there are made to eat, um, eat fish, but beavers do not eat fish. And this has become something that people have thought that everyone used to think, oh, beavers eat fish, but they don't. They're just vegetarian. They only eat plants and they cut down trees. And the other skull I've got here, look at this beauty. This is, and I'm sure many wow. of you can get, this is the other creature that Jasper was talking about, um, the wolf. Um, so the beaver and the wolf both were hunted to extinction. The beavers come back 
I personally would like to see wolves back. We've got wolves back in France, Germany, Netherlands, Spain, um, Italy. We've got wolves back in Europe, but we just seem too scared here in Britain to have wolves back. I think we should be personally, my personal opinion, we should be a bit braver because we would see these functioning ecosystems. We would have the hover, the pine hoverfly, um, and we would have so many more species as well. So yeah, very exciting. Um, and I've just been, I missed out on some of the chat when I was chatting. So I've just seen some really lovely questions here. People um, guess the polar bear, that's brilliant. And it's just been, oh, it's been really lovely to be able to speak to so many people and hear your views as well. Thank you so much, Jill. That was absolutely fantastic. Honestly, we're so um, so grateful for you to to come along and share all that with us. I could listen to you read your stories all day. Honestly, I almost wish I could. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much. Oh no, really lovely, and I just yeah, really lovely to connect with so many different schools, and I really look forward to reading your riddle challenges. I'd love to see some. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Jill. Bye for now. Bye, Jill. Thank you. OK, folks, I'm just going to get my screen loaded. And as I'm doing that, I'm still just in awe of Jill's stories and her presentation. Um, like I said, I wish she could keep. I wish she could keep telling them. Um, but hopefully it's inspired you and uh, just to just to highlight as well what Joe was saying. You know, quite often for eco schools, for example, myself and Kat and our other colleagues, we see so many um, fantastic actions around, you know, bug hotels and things to do with your school grounds. But it's, please don't forget that, like Joe was saying, the written word can have an absolutely fantastic impact on 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 biodiversity as well. You know, we're all able to to create these stories which will have a huge impact just like Jill has done with hers. Um, so think about that when you when you do biodiversity as a topic as well for eco schools, that it doesn't just have to be those those physical actions of creating habitats and things like that. It can also be linked to your literacy program and things like that. So Kat has uh, jumped ahead. I realise that we've probably all been sitting down now for quite a while. Um, this is just on the screen to mention about um, animal riddles from Jill's. If you have, you can find us on social media um, at Keep Scotland Beautiful or again email us. But like I say, we've been sitting down for a long time. So we thought now before we hear from our, our, our final speaker, we're going to have a bit of a just dance. So this isn't from us. This is just from YouTube. Just dance before I get in trouble for anything. Um, and I understand some of you might be too cool for school if you're P6, P7 in your secondary school, but just a bit of a shake off. We're going to have a just dance for a couple of minutes, which I think schools in Scotland should be quite aware of just dance. But if you're from further afield, this might be new to you. But if not, you can stand up at your desks um, and have a bit of a shake off and a dance to Just Dance. And if not, you can turn the volume right down and just imagine all the kids in schools doing it around the country. So thank you, Kat, and away we go.
Okay, folks, hopefully everybody's got a bit of energy back. Let me just share my screen and we'll get on to the next speaker. I just want everyone to know that I was 100% dancing with even though my camera was turned off. 100% dancing. Okay, oh, sorry, I've lost my screen. Okay, I'm now just going to introduce uh, Sarah Hazelhurst, she's already on our screens in front of us. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. So you might be thinking, what does fair trade have to do with biodiversity? Well, our friends from Fair Trade Foundation will explain us how they are connected and tell us lots more about how we are actually not just helping communities, but our natural world when we support fair trade practices. So we can get a big hello and thank you to Sarah from Fair Trade Foundation for joining us today and making this happen. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Jamie, and thank you for everyone who's already given workshops today. I know I'm really, really enjoying the live lessons. We've had my, some of my favourite bits so far. I've been seeing the wolves. I'm sure everyone's really enjoyed that. And as well, in the last session, I really enjoyed about how I can use my citizen's voice to talk about eagles and biodiversity in countryside. So thank you to everyone so far. I'm going to give you a little presentation today all about fair trade. So I'm just first of all, I'm just going to try and share my screen and make sure I've got all the tech before we get going. Amazing. So I'm sharing my screen at the moment. I just want to check really quickly that the sound of my video is going to play a little bit further along. So I'm going to play a snippet of just two seconds. And if you could say yes or no, if you can hear the sound. Yeah, Hi. you can hear that, Sarah. Amazing. That means I don't have to worry throughout my whole presentation <laughs> that that bit's going to work. Brilliant. And just one more check that you can see my screen OK? Yep, all perfect from my end. Amazing, thank you so much. So yeah, I'm really delighted to see um, to be here today from Fair Trade UK to tell everyone a little bit more about the Guardians of the Rainforest is what we're going to talk about. So I am Sarah and I'm our campaigns coordinator and it's part of my role that I visit virtually schools across the UK as well as places of worship and local communities and I spread the word about fair trade and farmers and all the farmers and workers who grow our food and our drink and also our clothes and lots of different products. So part of my role is to remind everybody, so individuals, schools, businesses and governments that we can all come together to choose the world that we want and to take action for a fairer future for everybody. So what are we going to learn today? I'm going to tell you a little bit more so that by the end of this lesson, you'll understand what fair trade means and what the Fair Trade Foundation does. We're going to talk a lot about cocoa as well. So hopefully by the end, you're going to be able to describe where chocolate comes from. You're going to be able to hopefully explain what forest friendly farming involves for fair trade farmers. And we're going to talk about how we can all individually take action for a fairer future. This is the fair trade logo. Uh, just in the chat, give me a little idea how many of you have seen the fair trade logo before. Oh, I actually can't see the chat, so if someone can give me an idea if it's lots of yeses or noes. Lots yeah. of yeses. Lots of yeses, that's brilliant. That's always what I like to hear. But I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the fair trade transition as well for anyone who doesn't know yet what the fair trade mark is. So the Fair Trade Foundation is an organisation that makes sure that farmers and workers all around the world are treated fairly. So farmers and workers put in so much work to produce the things that we eat, that we drink, that we wear, but some just aren't paid quite enough to support themselves and their families. 
So this is where the fair trade mark comes in. You might have seen this mark on packages in the supermarkets or maybe in your cupboards at home or your tuck shop at school if you're particularly fair trade aware. But there are so many different items and I'm going to show you a couple on screen now so that we do fair trade coffee. Fair trade chocolate, fair trade tea, bananas, orange juice, sugar, cotton. So fair trade cotton is a really big one. You can get school polo uniforms, which is fair trade cotton, pineapples and honey. So there are loads of different products which are fair trade and the Fair Trade Foundation works with these farmers to make sure that they're paid fairly for all the work that they do. So also today I'm going to talk to you about rainforest biodiversity. We're going to talk about rainforests and what impact fair trade has on the people who live in the rainforests and around the rainforests. So rainforests are an area of tall evergreen trees with a high amount of rainfall, for rainfall and they are one of the Earth's oldest living ecosystems, some of them surviving out their form it, and they've been around for 70 million years. So they are incredibly diverse and complex and home to half of the world's plant and animal species, even though they cover only 6% of the Earth's surface. So these are amazingly dense places full of flora and fauna, hundreds of different types of trees, species of birds, butterflies, insects. Rainforests absolutely thrive with their different range of animals, plants and fauna. So there are so many rich incredibly important things that come from our rainforests but also there's people who live in and around rainforests as well so lots of lots of um agriculture agricultural development has meant that rainforests have actually really suffered in the in the recent years and people who live all around these rainforests really need to make a living and sometimes aren't quite paid enough to cover their basic needs and it, in their lives, they have to make very difficult decisions when they try and make a living, sometimes which affects rainforests negatively as well through logging, mining and farming. But the health of the rainforests are everybody's responsibility all across the world. And we have a responsibility as a global community to support these environments and support the people living in them as well so they can have a fair future and they don't have to make these difficult choices to negatively impact the rainforests. So citizens, governments and intergovernmental organisations all need to work together to really practice to protect these invaluable, fragile ecosystems. So before we go any further talking about rainforests, I want to play a really quick quiz with everybody about which fair trade product am I? And I've got three rounds to this quiz. And in each round, I'm going to show you a picture of a fair trade product where it is being grown. So you'll see a picture and then you'll have three picture clues and each round will get a little bit harder than the last. So if you can just write in the chat what you think the fair trade product is. And then I might have to ask one of my colleagues to help me with some of the answers that are being written. So our first fair trade, what product am I? Here's your picture and your three clues are my name comes from the Arabic word for finger. I grow in tropical climates and I cannot grow properly if there are too many storms or hurricanes. Does anyone have any guesses what fair trade product this is? Brilliant, do we have any answers in the chat? Loads of Sorry. our answers. Lots of people saying minion food, bananas. <laughs> um, yep, banana, banana. Somebody said grapefruit. Amazing. Well, I'll give you the answer because it sounds like a lot of people have got this one right. So this is a fair trade banana. So well done to everybody who guessed that one right. Amazing. So I'm going to go on to our second quiz question now. So here is your picture clue. And then your three written clues are, I am one of the world's favourite sweet treats. 
I grow in hot, humid rainforest and I cannot grow properly if there are plant diseases on my farm. I can give you a minute to write in the chat what you think this fair trade product might be. Hi Sarah, we got, I think we got the answer almost immediately <laughs> from the, as soon as you put on one of the world's favourite sweet treats, um, everyone's saying cocoa beans. Amazing, thank you so much. So yes, everybody who said cocoa, well done. And this is, you're correct, what chocolate comes from, which we'll be speaking a little bit more on after this quiz. So big well done to everybody who got that right. And I've got one more fair trade product quiz question for you. And this one's a little bit more difficult. So have a little think when I show you. Here is your picture clue and then your other clues are. And one of the world's most popular drinks. I also grow in tropical climates and I cannot grow properly if there are droughts or floods on my farm. Does anyone know what fair trade product this is? Got lots of different answers this time. Cranberries, Amazing. grapes. Um, a lot of people saying my personal favorite thing in the whole world, which is coffee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> someone saying uh, cocoa again. Uh, what else? Amazing. So there's some really, really Tea. brilliant answers. Um, that's, yeah, that's, about it. that's all the answers. There you go. Amazing. Thank you so much. So yeah, I can see why a lot of people might say cranberries or grapes here, but in fact, you would be correct if you said coffee. These are in fact coffee cherries, and this is where we get our coffee beans from. So it's actually really interesting. Once these are picked, um, when they're lovely red and ripe, they are pulled apart and then roasted into make coffee beans that we all know. So yeah, this is a coffee cherry. So. If anyone got that, I'm really, really impressed. So well done, everybody. A little round of applause for anyone who got that one or any of the answers in the quiz at all. Brilliant. So now we've got a bit of an idea about what fair trade products we have and where they're grown. So we're going to go a little bit into more detail now about chocolate. So where does chocolate come from? So you might see a chocolate bar its end product when it's complete and packaged on your supermarket shelf but it doesn't start life like this at all have you ever wondered where it comes from and who helped make it where does chocolate start its life i'm going to tell you a little bit about that right now so this picture on the left is a cocoa tree so cocoa trees grow in the really hot humid regions of africa and south and central america about 90% of the world's cocoa beans come from West African countries like Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria and Cameroon. These are all really perfect temperatures um, to grow cocoa. So with proper care, cocoa trees grow pods like these in their fourth year and can continue to grow them for another 30 years. So you can see the pods on the trees and also you can see one that's being picked on the right hand side here, a cocoa pod. So the farmers, when, when they're ready to be harvested, they use the long handled tools to cut down the pods um, and they collect them in baskets. And a typical pod has 30 to 40 beans in it. And there's normally about 30 pods per tree. So if you're, I, I've already done some maths for you there. That's about 900 beans per tree. Um, and it takes 400 beans just to make one pound of cocoa. So if you think about that, you're going to need so many different cocoa pods and cocoa beans to grow enough to go in a chocolate bar. So there's normally lots and lots of cocoa trees that are all grown um, together. So when the, when the farmers harvest the pod, they take all these beans from the middle. And then here we are, they put them into piles and they put mats and banana leaves on top and the, the pulp that comes around them naturally surrounds the beans and heats up and ferments them, which really enhances the cocoa flavour. And then they're placed to be dried for several days 
And then once they're dried, they're placed into sacks like in the corner. And this is how the farmer can sell his cocoa or their cocoa. So this is the drying process. And this in the corner is where the cocoa goes into its bags to be sold. So cocoa is very much like a lot of fair trade products. So the answers to our quiz questions were bananas, coffee and cocoa. And these all things have in, co in common that they all grow in tropical climates near the equator. So you can see on this map, this line through the middle is the equator, which is the hottest part on the planet Earth. So th these conditions are perfect for cocoa to grow. So it's really hot and it's really wet. Um, and there's lots and lots of countries across this equator where they can grow. So they grow in tropical climates near the equator. It can also be damaged by extreme weather and they are impacted by the climate crisis as well. So as the earth is getting hotter and hotter, it's becoming harder to grow some of these products. But I want to tell you now about one cocoa farmer and his family in particular. So this is Bashe. And he goes to school in a village in Gohrun in Sierra Leone. And all of his family are cocoa farmers in the Gologorubu Cocoa F Farmers Union, which is a fair trade cooperative, which means that lots of different farmers who all live in Sierra Leone come together and they team up as a cooperative. And I've got a map here as well. So this map shows you the west part of the continent of Africa. And this is Sierra Leone, which is where he lives. And Bache's family depends on cocoa farming to make a living. It makes them enough money to meet their basic needs, so to buy food, clothes and to care for all of their family. And it is the perfect place in the world to grow cocoa because it's really hot, really wet, and they live in this lovely tropical climate, which is perfect for cocoa farming. They live right next to the Gola Rainforest, which is in Sierra Leone. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about forest friendly farming. So forest friendly farming is all about working together to farm sustainably, to protect the rainforest and support the livelihoods of all the farmers who work in and around the forest as well. So people need to know how to produce their cocoa whilst coexisting with the wildlife and all the landscape that exists around it. So how to live in harmony with the forest and um, being a fair trade farmer gives plenty of incentives to reduce the need to um, take away from the rainforest and to help it thrive. And there's two really in particular animals that I want to talk to you about today that live in the Gola rainforest. The first is a pygmy hippo. So there's not a lot of pygmy hippos left. Um, in the 1990s, there was only 3000 that still existed. And we think that would be even less number now since those last time that they were counted up. These declines in pygmy hippos come from their habitat being um, lost. And their destruction of the rainforest has come largely due to people have been logging mining, expanding their businesses and farming activities, which has meant that the pygmy hippos environment where, where they live is getting smaller and smaller, and which means their numbers have been dropping as well as they are getting more and more disturbed by human activities. But in being a fair trade farmers, the um, cooperative that live around the Gola rainforest in Sierra Leone, they've been able to invest in forest friendly farming and they've been reforesting reforestation their whole place. So rather than taking away trees, they've been putting extra trees back into the rainforest and by restocking and regrowing all of these trees, they've been able to add to the habitats for these pygmy hippos and their numbers have been coming back um, and more more hippos have been able to live happily in the rainforest. Um, so cocoa trees that like we showed you earlier on are a brilliant way of restoring trees because they don't grow in um, in lines in farms. Like if you think of a farm in the UK, there might be rows and rows of a crop. 
cocoa trees actually like to be quite far away from each other and in the shade of the rainforest. So you have to plant them really far away. So you can't industrially grow cocoa um, trees. So this means that in putting extra cocoa trees into the rainforest, um, they've been able to encourage the habitat and secure a home for more and more pygmy hippos to grow and thrive. And then secondly, I want to talk to you about chimpanzees as well. So chimpanzees live in the Gola rainforest. Um, they also live all around Western Central Africa as well. But in, in Sierra Leone, where Bashe lives, it's home to around 5,500 chimpanzees. And it is well known that chimpanzees love stealing crops and they will eat so many of the farmers' different products as well. But for a long time, this meant that farmers and chimpanzees didn't get on well at all. And unfortunately, a lot of chimpanzees were hunted by farmers to stop them eating and ruining the farmers' crops. But with forest friendly farming, farmers have come together to try and find a way to support the chimpanzees and still be able to sell their crops uh, and support the biodiversity of the rainforest. And in doing this, they've learned that if they plant mango trees all around the outside of their um, cocoa crop, then the monkeys will much, much rather eat the mango. And in doing this, they completely leave their crop alone as well. So this is added to uh, increased healthy biodiversity of the rainforest as farmers have learned to live side by side with animals. So they're two really brilliant ways that the goal of rainforest have learned how to forest friendly farm through pygmy, hippos and chimpanzees. So I've got a quick film for you now. In fact, it is four minutes long. So if and this is all about um, forest friendly farming and it is first hand from Bache telling you all about his family. So I'm going to play this now and um, I hope you enjoy the film. Hi, my name is Bese. Welcome to Sierra Leone. I live in a small town called Gorahun. Gorahun is near a great forest called the Gola Rainforest. Once, forests like this covered the whole country. But now there are only a few left. They are at risk from logging, mining and farming. In my community, we know that the rainforest is important to the whole world. We want to protect it. But it is not easy to do that when you have to make tough choices to survive. Life is difficult for many people who live in Sierra Leone. Many people do not earn enough money to meet their basic needs and it can be difficult to access education or medical care. Secondary school can be very expensive as children often need to travel to other towns and we have to pay for their food and accommodation. Almost no one from our community can afford college or university. My parents are members of a group of cocoa farmers called Gole Gobu, which means we who live at the forest edge. We were supported by the RSPB, Comic Relief and Divine Chocolate to come together as a fair trade cooperative to improve our own lives and protect the rainforest. Life is getting better now that my parents are part of Gole Gobu. Everyone in Gole Gobu looks after their farm in a way that will increase their income without harming the rainforest. We call it forest friendly farming, which means working together, farming sustainably, and protecting the rainforest and the animals that live in it. This is a cocoa pod. It is the fruit of the cocoa tree. The pods are cracked open and the beans are put into a basket to ferment. After the beans have fermented, they are laid out on a table to dry in the sun. Now the beans are ready to sell. 
Sometimes the farmer has to walk several hours to get to the collection point. Eventually, it will be shipped overseas and made into chocolate. After we sell the cocoa, we receive a fiat trade premium. The extra sum of money we get for selling on fiat trade terms. It is for the whole community. We have a committee where we decide how we will spend the money. The cocoa farmers of Gole Gobo have come together to protect the forest while earning a decent living through fair trade. If we all work together, we can save it. <laughs> Brilliant. So I hope you enjoyed hearing firsthand there all the different things that their cooperative is doing by the um, Gola Rainforest um, and all about forest friendly farming as well. So we have an activity for you today, but I'm not sure if there'll be time during this lesson, but I want to tell you all about it and maybe you could do it afterwards. So we're asking you to create a title of artwork called Guardians of the Rainforest. And I want you to use the knowledge that you've learned about the Gol Golag Boru and the beauty of the Gola Rainforest as your inspiration. So we have got a, um, a handout for you all, which should be available. Um, but otherwise, if you don't have the handout, feel free to just do this on a blank piece of A4 paper. And we're asking you all to draw your own rainforest and include all of the animals, plants and people that you look to protect for your forest friendly farming. And then just write a little bit at the bottom about why you chose those different people, different animals. It might be that you were really interested in the chimpanzees and the hippos that I told you about, or it might be something that you saw in Bache's film. So that's a really nice activity. And afterwards, you can either tweet them to our um, fair trade education account or you can send them to schools at fairtrade.org.uk and we'll be picking one um, at random and one of the prizes for the random one that we will pick will be um, a case Sorry, I skipped over that slide then here we go so it'll be a mixed case of 24 milk chocolate surprises eggs from the forest of hope and this isn't completely random um, these particular chocolate eggs come from the guardians of the rainforest so these um, cocoa beans that you saw and produced in this um, film this farm produced these beautiful forest of hope eggs and you can have the opportunity to win a case for your class by filling in either the um, the handout or just doing an A4 piece of paper with your guardians of the rainforest drawing. So we'd love to see as many of them as possible after today. And then finally, I want to talk to you a little bit today um, about how you can make a difference. So we've learned all about how cocoa is made and where it's come from and about fair trade farmers. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the difference that we, we can all make in our schools or in our home lives as well. So when you choose fair trade, when you see the label on a chocolate bar, you know that the one with the fair trade mark on, the farmers will receive more money for the products that they produce. They will receive a, enough money to meet their basic needs, such as food, clothes, medicine and education. They also will get an extra amount of money called a fair trade premium and the whole community decides what to spend the money on. Sometimes it's used to build better roads or get clean water in a certain area. So they, these are the really basic things that happen when you choose fair trade. But also we've spoken all about biodiversity today and when it comes to environment and forest friendly farming, farmers themselves are often the best people to ask about how we steward the environment. Climate change and biodiversity challenges have been apparent in countries on the equator for decades already and many people have been living in climate vulnerable countries 
have already learned how to deal with so many of these issues. Being a fair trade farmer means that you're able to afford to balance having a profitable livelihood, like having a cocoa farm, look after your family, but also be able to afford to look after the environment too. So when we choose fair trade, we can take responsibility in our part in making people's lives, livelihood sustainable. Also, the climate crisis isn't fair at all. So when a lot of farmers have to deal in their countries with the changing climate, we know that we can all take collective action to support the biodiversity of rainforests. So this first figure on the very left shows us as an individual, we can all make our own conscious choices to um, support fair trade. We can also use our citizens voice to ask governments and businesses to make sure that they stock fair trade and that they care about farmers like Bache and his family who are looking to support their local rainforests as well as make a fair wage. We also work with businesses, which is this middle picture here, so fair trade can make sure that farmers and workers in the supply chain are all paid fairly and have access to training. And then finally, this last picture represents governments, so wealthy countries who can support farmers in climate vulnerable countries who um, need support in supporting their own rainforests and being able to balance their own livelihoods with supporting um, the health of rainforests. So what can you do after today? You can learn all about fair trade, about biodiversity, climate change, or, or at school or at home. You can look for the fair trade mark. So when you pick what chocolate bars, what coffee, what bananas you pick, you can make a conscious choice to support the fair trade farmers to make sure that you know that they've got a fair wage. You can take part in fair trade fortnight. So this year it's already been, but it's normally around February. Every year we get together and we all celebrate fair trade fortnight by putting on events um, and celebrating all the fair trade farmers in our system. And then finally, you can become a fair trade school. So there are loads of fair trade schools all across the UK and you can get awarded um, with all the extra things that you do as a school um, and be able to show off that you are fair trade. And if you're interested in that, you can go to our website, schoolsfairtrade.org.uk, sign up to our school awards. We have three levels of award. We have fair aware, fair active and fair achiever. Each one you do a little bit more. So going from stocking fair trade in your school talk shops to making conscious decisions in your lessons and your curriculum to going even further and going doing challenges like fair trade fashion shows or hot chocolate Fridays, other really exciting things as well. And you get to show off at the end and, and tell everyone that you're a fair trade school. And that is one really brilliant way that you can support people like Bache um, and his family of cocoa farmers. Thank you, that is my end of my presentation today. I've not been able to see the chat throughout this whole thing, so I might just have a, a little look and see what's going on. It's been really nice, Sarah. Everyone's been really interactive and uh, answering the questions that you've, you've put forth, so it's been really, really lovely. Oh, amazing. And I'm just flicking through some of the answers as well. It looks like everyone really joined in, so that's lovely to see. Yeah, it's been absolutely great. And remember, folks, if you do have any questions for Sarah, um, you can if you put them on the chat or you can email us to them, um, we can hopefully get back to you uh, by Friday's assembly. But thank you so much, Sarah. That was amazing. It's so nice to see the pers the first sort of hand perspective of Bashe and his family and colleagues and things, I suppose, of how how our even our smallest choices of of what we buy in terms of chocolate and things like that have such a big impact, both positive and negative. So thank you for sharing that. No problem at all. Thank you for having me and I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you, Sarah. 
So I know folks that people are probably um, very close to lunchtime. So before I push on, we're just going to be an extra five minutes or something. But for those that have to go, um, it's just a reminder, as Sarah was saying and Jill, there is a competition for both of them. Um, so the resource resources are on the SharePoint, which um, Kat has shared a few times um, in the chat. So you should be able to access that. And as long as it is um, as long as they're submitted by 3 p.m. on Thursday, you will be entered into the draw um, for Friday. And as well, just a reminder of the, the quiz questions. If you have to leave um, within the next couple of minutes, um, you'll be able to access them as well if you're sort of pushed for time right now. But we'll be about another five minutes just for just to finish off. So I hope everybody's had a wonderful morning. Um, this is just a very small snippet of what certain organisations and individuals are doing. You know, sometimes we can feel very anxious about what's going on in the world when we talk about climate change and we talk about, you know, destruction of forests and things like that. But just on the screen, this is just a tiny, tiny snippet of the things that are happening just in in the UK. You know, there's so many organisations and there's so many people probably like yourselves that care about this so much that they want to, to have an impact. And if it is something you feel like you, you do want to explore more, then have a look at your local areas, have a look at your local context. There will be community groups and organisations out there that will be trying to have a really positive impact um, just going forward and there's absolutely ways that you can get involved through vol volunteering or just learning more about in school and then that equally links to eco schools and your fair trade award and things like that it all links together really really nicely um so absolutely uh, try in terms of other ideas of what you can specifically do in schools. There are some very, very simple things that we can do or maybe stop doing to keep helping our wildlife and biodiversity specifically in school, but also at home and in our communities as well. So things like filling every possible space uh, with life. You know, if you come from an urban school or you live in an urban area, which is like that concrete jungle that I was talking about at the very beginning, you know, there's loads of things you can do to still create greenery, which are habitats and food for, for species all over the UK. We've got some fantastic examples here. There's also things like if you do have a garden, you know, you can do simple things like just not not mow it, not mow it for the month of May. And um, because when as I think Joe was speaking about it, there are other weeds and things that come up which are still perfect for pollinators like dandelions, like daisies. All these sorts of things are, are perfect for these um, for these insects and stop using weed killers and chemicals in our gardens and things as well. So these just by doing these two things, you could have a huge impact. And imagine if all all of us in our class did this, all 250 classes, you know, we're talking maybe around 8000 people who could do this and it would have a such a positive impact. Other examples of things we could do as well are bringing back dark nights. So when we turn our lights on, in our houses or our communities and things like that, that can be quite confusing for a lot of plants, insects, mammals, that sort of, you know, all, lots of things. So remember to turn off the lights, just something as simple as turning off the lights, whether it's an outdoor light or indoor light with the curtains open or something like that, it makes a huge, huge difference. So simple things. And this is something that Sarah spoke about obviously as well, mind what you buy. Um, remember that the more stuff we buy, the more nature that was used and lost to make it. And even if you have to buy something, there are more sustainable options like fair trade that Sarah was talking about. And if you want to get something. So again, really simple things which have a, such a positive impact for not actually having to do very much, I feel. So other examples of things or ideas, keep learning, observing and enjoying. And that's a key thing. Never forget to enjoy the subject. I've loved it since I was probably your age and I think I'll continue to love it for the next 20, 30 years as well. Um, but there's ways to get more into it. You know, you could watch the Ospreys breeding season lives. That's live from the Woodland Trust. Uh, what else have we got? Join the Wildlife Trust 30 days wild challenge in June. 
get inspired with artists such as Andy Goldsworthy uh, with our old myths and folklore and create your own. So again, that's probably going back to Jill's point of even fiction can have such a huge part to play in this. It's not just non-fiction, you know, things that are real, things, stories that have happened. It's also the fictional aspect as well that has such a positive, um, positive outlook on it all. And then there's also our bingo games. These will be on the resources website. So there's one from the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland um, and there's one for native nature as well. Again, these are just a snippet. You might have your own where you are, so please just just have a have an explore um, and who knows what you'll find. OK, this is where we test everyone's knowledge to see if you remember. So remember, this is the quiz. So. I'll read them out for those of you. I think hopefully everyone should be able to see and these will be answered on Friday. So let's do your best to uh, to answer them here. I'll tell you how to submit once the questions, once I've read the, <laughs> read the questions out. So number one, how did wolves become extinct in the UK? So it was Jasper who was talking about that. Remember, don't say in the chat, this is for you only. And uh, number two, why does Jill Lewis think books are fierce and dangerous beasts? If I remember that correctly, Jill was speaking about that at the very end of her talk. Number three, in which way does fair trade help protect habitats like rainforest as well as communities? Hopefully that should be the freshest in your mind. Remember, don't say in the chat, this is for after. And this is how you submit. So send all Send all answers to your three questions to ecoschools at keepscotlandbeautiful.org. All correct answers will be put in the draw for the virtual zoo visit from the Royal Zoological Society, which well, that would be an amazing prize. Imagine getting a virtual tour wherever you are in the UK um, of the zoo, which would be so, so good. So one answer per class, please. So no cheating and multiple answers because we will check. So the winner will be announced this Friday at the assembly. OK, and again, I think as long as you have done this by 3 p.m. on Thursday, then you'll still be able to access. You'll still be able to submit your your answers. OK, we're about five minutes late, but I think that's fine, folks. Just finally, thank you so much for coming today. It was so fun. I don't know about you, but I had the absolute time of my life. It's probably one of the best Monday mornings I've had at work and I can't wait for the next one and to see you all on Friday. So thank you so much, folks. I hope you had a great time and we look forward to seeing you on Friday. Thank you, folks. I'll put it back to the question slide just as people are leaving off because I can see some people asking, but thank you so much. And thank you so much to all our speakers. It was such a great Monday morning. So thank you everyone to Jasper, to Jill, uh, to Sarah. I don't know if you can all come on and give us a wave before before you go. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the beaver skull finally. Thank you, it's been brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks, Jasper. Look forward to seeing everybody on Friday if you're able to make it. But again, don't worry, folks, if not, we've got recordings as well, um, which will be made available to you. So again, thank you from from everyone for joining us all over the UK.